Hi, and welcome to our 2021 annual Copenhaver lecture, um, which is being given in honor of Judge John Thomas Copenhaver. Born in Charleston, West Virginia in 1925, Judge Copenhaver is a senior federal district court judge for the Southern District of West Virginia and has been appointed to that position since 1975, six, sorry, um, when he was nominated by President Ford. He served on active duty in the U.S. Army during World War II, attended WVU and WVU College of Law, graduating in 1950. He served as a law clerk for Judge Ben Moore, worked in private practice, and served as the bankruptcy mediator for the Southern District before his appointment. Judge Copenhaver is considered one of the most eminent jurists in West Virginia and is honored in our annual lecture series focused on important <coughs> and timely legal issues. And today we are pleased to have Professor David Moore here for our 2021 Copenhaver lecture. Professor Moore is the Sterling and Eleanor Colton Endowed Chair in Law and Associate Director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Professor Moore graduated first in his class from BYU's College of Law, clerked for Justice Samuel Alito when he was on the Third Circuit, taught at the University of Kentucky, clerked again for Justice Alito on the United States Supreme Court, and moved to BYU after visiting at Georgetown and serving as an Olin Fellow at the University of Chicago. Professor Moore is a scholar of foreign relations law, international law, international human rights, and international development. As a human rights expert, he serves on the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's Moscow Mechanism, between 2017 and 2019, Professor Moore served variously as the acting deputy administrator and general counsel of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Please join me in welcoming Professor Moore for our annual Copenhaver Lecture. Thank you so much, Dean Reinhardt. It's a real privilege to be with you. Um, uh, as I've been thinking, there are uh, sort of longstanding ties, I think, between BYU and Utah and uh, West Virginia University. Um, I, I think President Gee was probably the first who came from Brigham Young from the state of Utah to, to ultimately be the dean here at West Virginia and uh, Dean Reinhardt, I think, the second. Um, uh, and so it's, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, uh, we, we have some other connections. I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint and um, show you. Let's make sure. Can you see that PowerPoint? No. No. Okay. Let me, uh, let me try again here. All right. How are we doing now? Yes. Great, thank you so much. Let me see if I can get this on. Um, so uh, we, we share mountains. Yours are far more lush uh, than, than ours. Um, and we share a little bit of John Denver uh, from country roads here to Rocky Mountain High. Uh, and it does say Colorado, but uh, we share those mountains. So I'm, I'm gonna take that as a tie to Utah as well. Uh, anyway, it's, it's been so fun already to, to be here. I'm teaching a course and really enjoying the wonderful students uh, that I'm getting to meet and uh, fellow professors um, from uh, Professor Cardi, whose son and I taught together at the University of Kentucky and, uh, and, and others in, in my area. So thank you so much for the opportunity and the warm welcome and the opportunity to, to learn from you and to experience the, the beauty and wonder of uh, your state and this law school. So I want to focus today on um, interpretation of international human rights. And this is a, a topic that I'm currently writing on. Um, it's a topic I come to from having served a brief time on the Human Rights Committee, uh, which is the UN body that oversees states compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, so I'll focus on uh, that, that committee, though um, my observations, I think, uh, apply to some of the other committees, uh, including potentially the international, excuse me, the human, the committee on the economic, social, and cultural rights, which is the uh, committee that oversees rights such as, as the right to health. 
So to kick us off, um, let me just quickly um, give us some background um, on the sources of, of international law. The two primary sources of international law generally and of human rights specifically are treaties, these agreements that states formally negotiate and um, then uh, ratify and express their consent to be bound by, uh, and customary international law, which is a body of law that states don't formally negotiate and codify. It's defined as law that emerges as states engage in a general, a consistent practice that they come to feel is legally binding upon them. So it has these two elements that is based on state practice and uh, this sense that this practice is legally binding, even though it doesn't appear in a treaty and even though states haven't formally consented to it. Um, so as we look to international law and interpreting human rights, we're looking specifically at these two sources and, and, and I will focus on the first of them, uh, treaties. Um, with that, a, a quick note on the development of international human rights. So the sources we looked to are treaties and customary international law. This body of law is relatively recent. There were some antecedents in, in history, but it's really the Holocaust uh, and the horrors of the Holocaust and World War II that wake up the world uh, to address the issue of international human rights. Previously, it sort of seems surprising now, but previously human rights were considered a domestic matter. But they concerned how a state treated its own citizens or those within its territory. And so it was a domestic concern, um, not so much of an international concern. And again, there were some exceptions. There were treaties entered to protect minority ethnic groups or religious groups in a particular country, um, groups that identified with the other party to the treaty, those, those sorts of things. Um, but it was really um, the Holocaust World War II that internationalized the question of, of human rights. And so uh, immediately after World War II, we get um, the 50 some states of the world that existed then coming together to agree by treaty to the UN Charter to create the United Nations. And in that charter to indicate that human rights were one of the topics um, that an international organization and particularly the United Nations should focus on. Um, the United Nations um, acts quickly then to uh, take up the cause of human rights and under the leadership of Eleanor Roosevelt and others, the General Assembly uh, quickly adopts the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the first international instrument um, to, to provide a universal uh, set of rights um, that are of concern to the international community. As a General Assembly resolution, the Universal Declaration is not automatically binding on states. It's not a treaty. Um, the General Assembly has power to make recommendations to UN member states. Um, but uh, this has become such a foundational docu document that it's widely considered to be or to reflect customary international law and to be binding uh, as custom, even though it isn't uh, a treaty. Following the Universal Declaration, there is this um, uh, consensus that we will codify the, the norms in the Universal Declaration into binding treaties. Uh, and initially, the idea was to put these into a single treaty, uh, but we enter into the Cold War period, and there are serious divides over um, what human what what qualifies as a human rights or or what human rights should be prioritized uh, and so the west favors um, civil and political rights things like the right to free speech the right to vote the right to freedom of religion or belief um, whereas uh, the communist east uh, focuses on things like the right to work or the right to housing uh, the right to food um, and so uh, we're unsuccessful in getting a, a single treaty, um, but two treaties emerged, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and um, 
uh, excuse me, I have got uh, the wrong uh, thing here. This should read the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Um, I borrowed this from an international religious freedom presentation. My apologies. So we, we get then the Universal Declaration plus these two covenants, the International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And these three documents together constitute um, the International Bill of Rights. Now, since that time, um, the countries of the world, many of them have adopted seven additional core human rights treaties. Uh, the first one uh, on racial discrimination actually enters into force. Before I think he's the two at the okay. Um, Let me know if you need anything. The first two covenants uh, become effective in 1976. So we start on these in sort of the late 40s and, and uh, it takes till 1976 before they enter into force. Uh, and before that time, the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination uh, enters into force. Uh, but after that time, we get uh, these other core human rights treaties on discrimination against women, um, torture, the rights of the child, migrant workers, rights of persons with disabilities, and uh, most recently on enforced disappearances. Um, and, and they are there are in conjunction with these treaties, additional protocols. Um, so there are sort of supplementary treaties to, to, to some of these um, uh, agreements. Um, one of the key ways that um, the international community has tried to ensure compliance with these human rights treaties is to establish through these treaties what are called treaty bodies, essentially committees of independent experts who are elected to serve on, on the committee um, who then oversee states compliance with their treaty obligations under the particular treaty. So for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights creates a human rights committee, that's what it's called, of 18 independent experts who oversee states compliance with the ICCPR. Um, and, and I had the opportunity to, I was nominated by the, to be the US candidate for this committee and elected to serve a, a, a brief term on, on the Human Rights Committee. So that's the committee I'll particularly focus on. Again, the, the comments um, have, have broader application. Um, but as another example, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights designated a UN body, the Economic and Social Council to oversee states compliance, but the Economic and Social Council delegated that responsibility to a committee it created, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So there's a treaty body uh, for that committee. There's a committee for the Convention on Torture, et cetera. Each of these nine core human rights treaties has at, one, at least one treaty body one of them, the Convention on Torture, has two. Uh, one, one committee focused on prevention of torture and one uh, looking at violations of uh, the Convention on, on Torture or other uh, compliance issues. Um, so what do these committees do? Um, uh, they have, there's some variety of function across uh, these 10 committees. But the three sort of core responsibilities that you see uh, across these institutions are listed here. The first is that by treaty, states are required to, to report to these committees on their practices under the, the, the treaty in question, right? Report on their compliance um, with their treaty obligations. And so, uh, initially after ratifying a treaty and then periodically thereafter, a state submits a report to the, the relevant committee. Um, the relevant committee will also receive information from non-governmental organizations and other entities, national human rights institutions who provide information on how well a state is complying with its obligation. Um, and then the committee sits down with a delegation from the state under review and will conduct what's called a, a constructive dialogue where the committee asks the state representatives questions, expresses concerns uh, and provides the state an opportunity uh, 
to uh, respond. Um, and, and this whole process leads to a document in which the committee provides what are called its concluding observations to the state on its report. Uh, and in those concluding observations, the committee will mention some things the state is doing well, and then they'll express their concerns, right? These are the things we're concerned about and make recommendations as to how the state can improve its human rights record under the treaty. It does designate some of those recommendations for follow-up, and so the state will need to come back and uh, uh, report on those. Um, otherwise, the next time they get reviewed, you know, the committee may look back at those, at those uh, concluding observations and the issues uh, that they relate to. Um, so that's one of the primary functions of these uh, over, oversight slash compliance committees. The second function is um, to issue what are called general comments, uh, at least in a lot of the committees, they, they bear that title. And um, these are essentially uh, amplifications of issues or articles in, in the treaty. Uh, so, for example, in something like uh, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, there's a right to the highest attainable standard of um, physical and mental health, an issue we're looking at in, in, in my course. Um, well, that's, that's a pretty broad statement. What does that include? How does a state comply with that? What's going to come up short? Um, the a committee will take a couple years and um, look at this issue and then uh, publish a general comment where it provides uh, guidance to the state parties on what a right actually means and what's expected uh, of them. The last thing these committees do in general is to hear what are called, receive and, and decide individual communications. Um, so generally these treaties or, or a lot of them will have an optional protocol, a supplementary treaty. And if a state signs on to that, it accepts the jurisdiction of the committee to hear complaints of individual, from individuals uh, or, or groups of violations of uh, human rights obligations. And so um, this provides a mechanism for individuals to come before the committee, for the state to respond, and for the committee to uh, decide whether there's been a human rights violation, um, and, and uh, if so, to order some sort of uh, rep reparations. When I say order, right, these are, um, again, the, the, there's, there's not the sort of enforcement authority um, that you see in international law that you generally see in a developed domestic system like ours, right? But um, there's uh, where, where states have signed on to the jurisdiction of the committee to hear these in individual communications, there's certainly an expectation that they are bound then to uh, follow the committee's decision. Well, in all of this, um, all of these uh, functions, the, the reviewing state reports and issuing concluding observations, um, drafting and publishing general comments, hearing and resolving individual communications, all these functions require these bodies to engage in treaty interpretation. Um, and, and so what I wanna focus on is what the rules are under international law for interpreting a treaty and ask whether one of these committees, the one I served on, uh, the Human Rights Committee, follows the, the international law of, of treaty interpretation. And um, my experience, uh, and I'll share some examples, is that the committees are not uh, good or consistent in following the international law of, of treaty interpretation. So I'll provide some examples. Um, and then discuss sort of the pros and cons, right? It's not that, um, uh, that not following the international law treaty interpretation is necessarily a bad thing. There are some benefits that come from, from that, but there are some costs to it as well. Uh, and so I wanna explore those a little bit and, and make some recommendations. So um, this is uh, fairly busy here. Um, this is, uh, uh, part of an article from the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. So there is a treaty 
um, that codifies the law of treaties, how states enter them, what they're obliged to do once they enter them, and critically for our purposes, how you interpret treaties. Um, and uh, starting here with the, the first subparagraph, it says, a treaty should be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty. So we, we look at the text and sort of the, or the, the normal meaning, uh, ordinary meaning of the text. Uh, but it goes on to say in their context and in light of uh, object and purpose. So there's a purposive element as well. And there's contextual things. Now, what qualifies as context is addressed in the next uh, paragraph, which says that uh, context includes your preamble, annexes to the treaty, also agreements, side agreements, or unilateral instruments that were adopted in conjunction with the conclusion of the treaty that were meant to um, uh, reflect the interpretation of the treaty. These are, are, are fair game or should be considered as well. Um, in addition, the article goes on to say, beyond context, you should look at things like later agreements between these parties uh, regarding their interpretation, or the practice of the parties that's emerged in applying treaties that reflects an agreement on how we should understand the treaty, um, as well as other relevant rules of, of international law that are applicable in, in relations between the parties. Um, one thing that's not mentioned is um, the negotiating history. Uh, the Vienna Convention goes on in the next article to say you can turn to supplementary means, including the negotiating history, but only under certain circumstances, right? You can do it to confirm the meaning you got from those other considerations. You can do it if those other considerations are gonna lead to uh, an ambiguous or uh, obscure result or a, a manifestly absurd or unreasonable result. Um, so you don't turn to the negotiating history immediately, but there is some opportunity under, under certain circumstances. That's a lot, right? There are a lot of factors that the Vienna Convention includes in the law of treaty interpretation. To, to sort of quickly summarize, we're looking at ordinary meaning of the text, the context, uh, the purpose of the treaty, other agreements, practices the states have engaged in, and other uh, principles of, of international law. So what I want to do then is turn to a particular committee, the Human Rights Committee, which oversees the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and use that as a case study in um, how well these uh, treaty institutions are applying the international law of, of treaty interpretation. And, and I've deliberately chosen um, examples of treaty interpretation that uh, share two characteristics. One is something I, I, I bumped up against in my time on the Human Rights Committee. So something I sort of had personal experience with. And two, um, issues that are very controversial because I think it's in those controversial moments or controversial uh, issues that need to be interpreted where the pressures are the strongest. Uh, and um, uh, if there is a willingness on the part of the committee to depart from the international law of treaty interpretation, we're most likely to see it in those uh, contexts. So um, the, the two examples I have, and we may not have time to get to, to both of them, but the first is um, the Human Rights Committee's interpretation of Article 6. Um, this provision um, uh, states that every human being has the inherent right to life, that the right shall be protected by law, cannot be um, subject to our arbitrary deprivation. So what's included within the right to life? Um, and the two things I want to focus on are the breadth of the committee's interpretation of this right, and then how the committee has looked at abortion under this right. And again, deliberately looking at um, some controversial things to see what, uh, what's the committee's commitment to the international law of uh, treaty interpretation. Um, so first, um, the committee has, in a general comment, interpreted the right to life, not to just be an inherent right to, to life, but a right to life with dignity. Um, 
And so you compare that to these considerations that we've just identified as uh, considerations that should govern treaty interpretation. Um, th there's, there's no qualifier to the right to life in the, the, the specific test, except that it belongs to everyone and that it's inherent. Um, uh, so are you. So, turning to the, the context, um, the, the article in which the right to life appears speaks in that first paragraph of arbitrary deprivation, right? Prohibiting arbitrary deprivation. It then goes on to talk about genocide and capital punishment. And so in, in the context of the article, it looks like you know, this right to life is really focused on deprivation, right? prohibiting deprivation, whether it's arbitrary, uh, whether it's uh, in conjunction with genocide, right, or whether it's the application of capital punishment, um, that it's the sort of deprivation of life that the article is, is focused on. Now, when you broaden the context to the preamble, um, the preamble does say that human rights are based in uh, human dignity, the human, the inherent dignity of every individual, which I think uh, is a, a really important aspect of uh, the covenant. Um, but it's one thing to identify as the grounding. It's another thing to convert the foundation or motivation for the right into the right itself. And so taking the right to life and making it a right with dignity um, arguably um, expands it uh, significantly. And we see that in the general comment. Um, the, the committee says that the right to life extends to things like a right to sex education, a right to nuclear non-proliferation, um, an obligation on states to address things like uh, traffic accidents, uh, the environment, disease prevention, hunger, malnutrition, poverty, homelessness. Um, and certainly all these things I think are connected to life or a life of a particular quality, but the sheer breadth of them I think raises sort of questions about is the committee really following the law of treaty interpretation uh, to get this much into, um, uh, into this particular text, uh, the right to life? Um, and I think there's uh, an argument that uh, the, the committee is going a little too far, right? If we continue with context, the treaty in which this um, provision uh, appears is a treaty on civil and political rights. And we generally don't think of things like malnutrition, poverty, homelessness as, um, as uh, civil and, and political rights. Uh, in fact, right, if we look at other agreements, another consideration that we're, we can look at under international treaty interpretation, we have a companion treaty to the ICCPR, the ICSCR, which specifically address economic, social, cultural rights, such as uh, the right to, to food, to housing, to work, to health, um, suggesting that, again, in context, that's not what this provision of the ICCPR was intended to uh, address. Um, and certainly if we look to subsequently what states have done, the fact that states entered, have entered into seven additional human rights treaties suggests that um, the right to life in this one provision of the ICCPR was not meant to address every human good. Though certainly, uh, you know, if you interpret it as a right to life with dignity, it can expand to, to everything that would benefit individuals in, in the course of, of their life. And so, um, again, I think this is an example where the breadth of what the committee has found uh, to fit within the inherent right to life um, does not fit well with the international law of, of, of treaty interpretation. I think we say, see the same thing when the treaty uh, or the committee addresses abortion. And so um, the committee interprets the right to life to include a right to abortion, uh, recognizing that states can impose some limits. It doesn't, the committee doesn't uh, get into a real, uh, the issue at a real granular level, um, but it does uh, uh, recommend to states, uh, find violations, um, if, if states do not recognize a right to abortion. And again, I think if you apply the international law of treaty interpretation, um, the text right to life, that's usually the language that is used to um, support uh, 
life and, and not abortion, right? Not, not to support abortion so that the ordinary meaning of that, I think both in the United States and, and globally, uh, wouldn't lend itself to a right to abortion. You look at the context, um, uh, Article 2, in which this language appears, goes on to prohibit the execution of pregnant women, um, suggesting that there is you know, another interest at stake when, when someone is pregnant. Um, the overall purpose, again, seems to be focused on the deprivation of, of life. Um, again, we have other agreements to deal with the right to health, et cetera. And uh, in looking to subsequent practice, um, th there's disagreement internationally. Um, there's certainly a lot of support for an international human right to abortion. There's a lot of opposition to that. If we look at states' actual practices, um, there's a fair divide sort of north and south uh, on um, uh, state practice with regard to abortion. And even in those countries that um, re recognize a right to abortion, right, different limits on when it's permissible, uh, et cetera. Um, now, the, the negotiating history or the French term travaux preparatoires, again, we, we said is not something you can turn to immediately. Um, but, but looking into that negotiating history, there were, was in the course of creating this treaty proposals to ban abortion, and those weren't adopted. Uh, there were never pro proposals to uh, recognize a right to abortion. Um, and so I think the Travaux suggests this is simply an issue that wasn't, um, wasn't uh, addressed or resolved in, in the treaty. Um, I'll give quickly one other example. I want to leave some time for, for questions. Um, so, so again, I think applying the international law of treaty interpretation to the issue of right to life, whether it's the breadth of it, whether it's how it um, perceives abortion, right? The committee's interpretation does not fit well uh, with, with um, the international law of treaty interpretation. Another article and, and controversial um, provision or, or controversial interpretation has come in the uh, Article 2, which defines countries' obligations under the covenant. Uh, and it says that countries undertake to respect and ensure to all individuals, and this is the key language, within their territory and subject to their jurisdiction, the rights recognized. So this defines the scope of a state's obligations, treaty obligations under, under the covenant to, to persons within the territory and subject to the state's jurisdiction. Um, here, uh, the committee has interpreted that and as an or, and um, you know, there's, I think, room for arguing that that's uh, acceptable and, and uh, consistent with international law of treaty interpretation. So it's states have obligations to persons in their territory or subject to their jurisdiction. Um, the committee's expanded on that, um, getting to, to things that maybe are a little bit more controversial, a little harder to square with the law of treaty interpretation. Uh, to extend state obligations to persons within the power or effective control. Um, so this could be outside territory and outside jurisdiction in the sense of your legal jurisdiction, your, your ability to apply your law or to enforce uh, your law um, to maybe situations of conflict uh, where, where people are um, under your military might or something like that. Um, and most recently, while I was on the committee, the committee um, extended uh, territory and jurisdiction to include persons who are in a special relationship of dependency. Um, and this arose in a tragic case where um, refugees on the Mediterranean uh, were in a vehicle that sank and, and many were killed. Um, the, the accident occurred outside Italy's territory, outside its territorial waters, outside its search and rescue zone on the high seas. It occurred in Malta's um, uh, search and rescue zone on the high seas. Um, but the court found that Italy had an obligation um, to have uh, assisted in this, this shipwreck because of a special relationship of dependency factually calls, the first call in distress had gone to Italy, 
Um, Italy stayed involved in the effort. It had a ship that uh, was, was nearby. Uh, and essentially the court found factually, legally, Italy had some obligations under other law to act reasonably, et cetera. Um, and so the court found a special relationship of dependency between Italy and uh, those involved in the shipwreck uh, found that Italy's actions could have helped them. Uh, and so um, these individuals fell within the territory and jurisdiction of, of Italy under, under the covenant. Um, again, I think uh, hard to square with the international law of treaty interpretation. We don't have time to go through all those elements, um, but, but at least I think it's apparent that it's uh, an expansion of um, that, that language. All right, so um, what's the problem here? Right? On one hand, there isn't one. I mean, you look at that Italy case, um, or you look at the committee's expansive interpretation of the right to life, and you could con easily conclude that at least a lot of these things are normatively desirable, right? This is fantastic to expand uh, the human rights obligations. It's fantastic to say, Italy, you should have got involved where you could have. Um, even though maybe these people weren't strictly with, certainly weren't in your territory, maybe weren't within your jurisdiction, um, you could have done something to, made a diff to make a difference uh, and, and, and you should have under, under the covenant. So on one hand, uh, what the committee is doing seems to be driven by normative goals uh, that we might applaud um, and particularly applaud because um, it's not easy to expand or get new human rights. Uh, I think I mentioned the international covenants were started in I think the late 40s, um, didn't enter into force until 1976. And so you have this uh, period of 25 years or so in the development of these uh, human rights norms. Um, that's, that's a hard process to go through. Uh, and maybe we've gotten faster. We, you know, we have these seven additional core human rights treaties and other protocols uh, to them. Um, but, but still, you know, if you can advance human rights, create new rights, expand rights through the interpretation of these treaty bodies, that's a lot easier than doing it through uh, the treaty making process. And so uh, I think there are some pros to this approach to be fo focused more on normative ends um, than simply on the application of the international law of, of treaty interpretation. On the other hand, there are costs, right, to, to this sort of approach. Um, and I think one of those at least or sets of costs maybe come under the umbrella of the rule of law. Um, that one of, the, one of the things we're trying to accomplish in international law, international human rights, is the establishment of the rule of law. And this is not a great example of that. Uh, if the committee is ignoring the applicable law on treaty interpretation and substituting its own goals um, and uh, preferences, um, then that's inconsistent with the rule of law. It creates notice problems. Um, you know, it can give rise to claims of elitism that you sort of have to be in a particular community to understand this stuff or be a player in it, uh, et cetera. Um, this also raises the risk of reduced participation, right? That states are gonna be less willing to enter these sorts of treaties or to submit to the uh, oversight of international institutions if um, they, they, they can't be sure that those uh, institutions are gonna abide by the governing law and instead are gonna uh, be more expansive or, or aggressive. Um, and so our, our, our fundamental enterprise of trying to get states on board um, to these human rights commitments and actually follow through on them, right, is, is put at risk to some degree uh, with this sort of approach to, to interpretation. Um, so, so what do we do, right? Um, my experience on the committee suggests to me that there are ways to balance both these approaches, right? That we don't, uh, we don't have to exclude normative considerations and goals um, to achieve the rule of law goal um, through, through strict application of the international law of, um, of treaty interpretation. 
Uh, and so um, looking at the, the three main functions of the Human Rights Committee and, and other treaty bodies, um, it, it seems to me that some of these functions lend themselves very well to the application of um, the, the international law of treaty interpretations. And at least one of the functions may um, be more amenable to uh, more progressive interpretation and uh, normative uh, development of, of the of human rights under the covenant. So my, my proposal would be for the committee to um, strictly apply the international law of treaty interpretation when it's issuing its general comments. Um, partly this is for functional reasons. It takes the committee about two years to issue a general comment. So there's plenty of time to uh, sit down with the law of treaty interpretation and uh, analyze how it applies to the particular provision being interpreted. Um, it's, it's less easy to do that with individual communications. Uh, these communications to the committees are increasing. The Human Rights Committee already, already has a backlog of over a thousand of these individual communications. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a great moment to be able to be really reflective and technical and apply the international law of treaty interpretation. But if you've already done that in the general comments, um, then you have this source you can turn back to to say, okay, this should guide our um, application of this particular provision as to this individual communication. Um, and where you're deciding whether there's a violation of the treaty or not, right, it's, I think, quite important that the committee apply the international law of treaty interpretation. The last function of the committee, I think, provides a broader opportunity, and that's this review of state reports and the issuance of concluding observations on how well a state is, is doing in, in, um, in complying with its treaty obligations. I think that's a moment where they think the committee can make recommendations uh, related to a very broad right to life, right? To traffic accidents and the environment and abortion or, or other matters. Um, make those recommendations to the states and then the states have the opportunity to decide whether they will accept those recommendations. But if they do, the international law of treaty interpretation says that sort of subsequent practice of states can be considered in interpreting the covenant. Right? And so it would be consistent with the covenant then to take into account the, the, the acceptance by states of recommendations made by the committee in these conclusive observations and the interpretation of the, the covenant could evolve in normatively desirable ways, but consistent with the international law of, of, of treaties. Um, and so that's where I hope to see the, the treaty bodies going, sort of securing both these rule of law values, um, trying to attract states to the human rights system, uh, and still preserve an opportunity to uh, influence human rights for, for the better uh, through, this, through this process. So let me stop there and um, open some time for questions and comments. I'm going to try and stop sharing so I can see you. Let's see. I think I said, John, John did you have a, um, John Taylor, I see your hand raised. Yes. Thank you for, thank you for this talk. So this is probably very naive because I don't really know anything about international law, but I've learned, but I've, I've learned from it. So um, you've got a situation, right, where countries have the choice whether they're going to sign on to these kinds of international covenants. In yeah. any agreement you sign, right, um, there has to be a body to interpret the agreement because it's not going to interpret itself. And that means you're always taking something of a risk that the agreement may come to be understood to mean something that you weren't necessarily sure it was going to mean when you signed up. Right? All those are inherent risks. And I guess the notion that there's actually binding law of treating interpretation is one of the things that is supposed to limit those risks. So you have some idea of like how far you can go. Right. To the extent you're in, and to the extent that your intuitive argument is, look, nobody when they signed on to the right to life would have thought to inherit right to life would have thought that that was going to mean 
a whole panoply of kind of positive rights to support human flourishing. Um, and at the same time was also going to say, um, you know, you can't ban abortion. I, I, to the extent your argument is, I bet people didn't feel they were signing up for that. That seems to me, you know, plausible. Um, right. But but if I'm a signatory and one of these general comments comes down and I think that's a ridiculous stretch of an interpretation to what I agree to, I mean, don't I just like ignore it? Um, and, and if I do ignore it, what happens? Yeah. Um, no, so that's that's an excellent question. And so there is a, an opportunity for states to object to general comments. Uh, so the treaty refers to the committee making general conference, and I think says, and states can share their observations on those or something along those lines. Um, so I think if there were a robust process for following that through, that would be another avenue for evolution. Um, I, I'm still not sure it excuses um, sort of deliberate uh, re uh, rejection is too strong, maybe indifference to the international law of treaty interpretation, right? It seems that um, as, as a body trying to uh, oversee uh, a body of law, um, that there should be an effort to comply with the law that governs that uh, exercise. Um, so I'm not sure it, it would completely excuse sort of uh, going free reign with, with the general comments. But again, there is an opportunity for states to, to respond, but there isn't really a dialogue back and forth at that point. Yeah, there's input along the way, right? But this stands as the treaty's interpretation, which will then inform whether the treaty uh, body finds violations with individual communications or makes certain recommendations to, to the committee. Um, and so while you can um, uh, post, uh, note your opposition, this is gonna go forward without you. Um, uh, and again, so it seems to me that if we were more true to the law of treaty interpretation and the general comments and individual communications, there would still be this opportunity for dialogue. But again, the, 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 the concluding observations um, seem a better format, uh, partly because, again, these recommendations to countries that they then have to come back and, and report to the committee on. Um, so you get that dialogue and sort of sense of, I've considered, we've decided to adopt, and you get then this body of evidence as to state practice that can, again, can then be taken into consideration consistent with the law of treaty interpretation as, as you move forward. I guess one other comment I would make is that um, one of the things that was really interesting to me when I was uh, in this campaign for the, the Human Rights Committee is that um, countries' resources make a big difference. I was um, meeting with a representative from Vanuatu, as I recall, and they were a party, I think, to three of the, the nine core human rights treaties. And um, they seem to be very sincere in their desire to uh, adhere to human rights. Um, but they frankly said, the reporting burden is so large with these treaties that we're reluctant to sign on to additional ones because we don't have the resources to report to nine committees. Um, and I think that applies to the general comment context. You rarely see a developing country respond to a general comment. It's the United States, it's France, it's Germany, it's the UK maybe, right? And so that uh, I think that's another reason why that opportunity to, um, to express opposition to a general comment is, is not a great forum uh, for, for the evolutionary process. Thanks for that, that was a great question. Thanks for your response. Yeah, Allison? Yeah, this maybe picks up with where with where John left off, but um, I'm just curious about whether it's an additional risk then that you might have um, the the treaties or you know uh, the way that treaties are developing um, expressing something that that appears facially to be state practice that in fact isn't for the you know for the reasons John was suggesting and that you were suggesting and whether 
um, that is something that you're seeing to happen and whether that is, um, you know, just kind of, you know, whether you have data or anecdotes about that so that, um, you know, is, is that, a, and is that a cost that the committee is consciously weighing? So is this, um, to make sure I understand the question, are you thinking when the treaty is negotiated and, um, you know, does it reflect state practice at the time? Or are we talking about this sort of later practice um, that the states are engaged in? The later practice. These, okay, the later practice. Okay. About. Yeah. yeah, I don't, um, I can't think of a particular, you know, my ter term was brief. I can't think of a particular example that I saw while on the committee. Um, uh, what I what you do see is the committee certainly relying on its jurisprudence, and so you get sort of subsequent development through the committee's jurisprudence that's relied on. Um, and I think there's certainly room. I just can't think of a specific example where I've seen this for the committee to say, "Now um, uh, this is customary international law," or even if it doesn't rise to that level, we've got enough state practice to um, rely on that to say the, the treaty means X. Um, again, I think it's, it's, it's available. I, I haven't seen a lot of it. Um, and I think part of that is um, that uh, just the pressure to decide these individual communications, you know, that you have so many on your plate. And so there's not a lot of time um, to, to sit around and say, well, what are states actually doing now? Um, I, I think to the extent it happens, it's more a gut sense and sort of, you know, um, your sense as an expert in international law as opposed to uh, a, a rigorous sort of evaluation of where state practice is, is at. I'm not sure I've answered your question though. It, yeah, maybe I could follow up just quickly. I wanna leave yeah, time for please. others, but um, what I was thinking of, and, and this might be because I don't quite understand the system, but what I was thinking of is that these um, responses to communications are supposed to be, at least in your view, articulating what the treaty actually means. And right. then maybe there's room in the comments for, for leading a little bit into yes, where right. this might be going. Um, and so my concern, you know, so maybe another reason that might support your kind of proposal here is that um, if the committee is instead giving opinions that they say are what the treaty actually uh, means, but really aren't what people contemplated and only a few countries are likely to publicly object to that. Are we then developing a body of treaty law as interpreted that doesn't really reflect state practice? Got it, sorry, I, I, I think I missed that uh, core point. And, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that is one of the risks that develops. So, you know, I mentioned sort of rule of law concerns, yeah. um, states being less willing, but you've identified a third um, uh, cost of this, that international law becomes detached from reality, right? This, and maybe it ties in a little bit to the elitist uh, reference I made, right? That a certain body of people understand international law in one way, um, but, but it's pretty divorced from reality. And um, I do think that's a serious risk. Um, e even within the core of the treaty, right, even when the interpretation is not controversial, right, non-compliance is still widespread. You know? So you even have this problem of, of, of disconnect. Now it's, it's not a situation where you want to follow the disconnect, right, and make the treaty conform to, um, but, but even in the obligations that it's quite clear states have assumed, um, there is a disconnect with, with practice. So I think that's a good point. There's, an, there's another cost there. Um, to, to getting too far ahead. Thank you. If there were a way to research it, that would seem to be an interesting thing to, to try to get some data around. Yeah, it, it would be. You know, it, it goes back to just the difficulties with customary international law, right? How do you find what 200 states are doing and what they're <laughs> thinking? Um, uh, but, but you're absolutely right. Actually, now that you mentioned that, one of the um, members of the committee when I was on, um, Christoph Hines from South Africa, was doing a um, study that's maybe not exactly what you're um, talking about, but he was trying to track the impact of um, the committee on state practice. So that would tie in to some degree, right? If you could confirm that states are conforming their practices to decisions the committee has made or 
you know, altering their laws in response to a general comment or something like that, it, it would both ref show the committee's having an impact, but also that maybe this disconnect isn't, or at least give us a sense of the disconnect, right? How broad it is. So that's a good point. Yeah, oh, sorry, Robert, I see your hand raised. Yes, uh, as you were talking, it sort of uh, struck me that this parallels a lot of sort of the domestic struggles we've had on interpreting human rights, whether it's through a constitutional amendment or a less textual sense of dignity. And I was just curious if this problem of interpretation is applying in multiple levels from our national constitutions to our global efforts. And I'm just wondering if it's sort of a, a universal struggle that anytime we attempt this task, we're gonna be exactly back in these <laughs> debates between Scalia and Kennedy or something right. like that. And just had to, uh, wanted to make the observation and see if you had any thoughts on that. But thank yes. you for coming. No, thank you. That's a, a fantastic observation. And I think you're exactly right that this is not a dynamic limited to the treaty bodies or to international human rights. In a sense, this is um, one of the challenges of judicial review and it's reflected in the sort of debates you've, you've referenced. I think one difference here is that um, with international law, we do have a body of law about interpretation. Um, so there's more room for contestation in the constitutional interpretation field about whether we should be originalist of one stripe or another, right, or more purpose, more evolutionary, um, uh, partly because there is no uh, body of interpretive law to guide those, those questions. And this, so there's a lot more room in, in my mind um, to take different positions. Um, so I think you're right that the dynamic exists probably in any context where there's something that looks like judicial review. Um, but uh, I think it's easier to, um, to identify a more aggressive approach as problematic where there is law governing the approach. Uh, uh, and, and that's, you know, that's partly what troubles me here, that you have uh, people who are elected to these committees for their expertise, they don't have to be lawyers. The committee or the, the, the covenant refers to sort of, you know, with account for people who have legal background, um, um, but, but they are international experts. Uh, and, and so it's certainly not beyond a committee like this. And, and I think it's not too high of an expectation to say, you know, in applying international law, you ought to follow uh, international law. Um, and, and again, I don't think that prohibits uh, the evolution, but we've got to find ways um, to, to think about normative as evolution that are consistent with that law. That's, that's uh, sort of where I land. Thank you very much. That's a great observation. So it looks like we're coming up against our time, I see. One more minute, uh, so I'd be happy to entertain more question, one more question, but uh, regardless, I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, thank the college um, and uh, the Copenhaver family for this uh, incredible opportunity for me. It's, it's been a real pleasure. All right, with that, I think we'll, we'll end it. So thank you everyone, have a wonderful day and a wonderful university break. <laughs>